might have said something, you might have backbitten somebody, you may have slandered another person, maybe you took the right of another person, maybe you harmed another person, maybe you took something which didn't belong to you, maybe you indulged in interest, maybe you did something which you shouldn't have done, you looked at something, you listened to something, or you did something which you shouldn't have done. How many sins that we have committed, how many times we've disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we considered it something small. If you want to sin against me, harm me, neglect me for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, then one time in your life, only once in your life, you've decided that I want to make tawbah and you said, Ya Rabb, Allah says, Ya Abdi, what do you want? And he said, Ya Allah, forgive me. He says, my slave, I have forgiven all your sins. What's the point of even seeking forgiveness? If you know what I'm doing, you know the kind of stuff I'm up to? You don't want to know, bro. I'm bad. I can't even worry about forgiveness anymore. I mean, the people who are good, they try to make istighfar and stuff. I've, I'm involved in way too much. And I don't see myself getting out anytime soon. Allah says, don't cut yourselves off. Don't lose hope. Don't become completely depressed from the loving mercy and care of Allah. Allah didn't stop loving you. Allah didn't stop caring about you. Allah never says in Quran, He wants to punish you. He says the opposite. Why would He want to punish you? That's literally what He says. Allah will forgive all sins all together. I will wipe your slate so clean, there won't be even a little stain. Everything will be gone. All of them all together. No doubt about it. He He's the only one that is excessively forgiving. Allah is ready to forgive everything. Allah is ready to start you for fresh, completely new. But that is not the only thing. My slaves, now that you know I will forgive everything, then come back to me, come back to your master. He says, I'm ready to forgive you, but I, my forgiveness isn't free. You have to do something to earn it. Come back to me, turn your hearts back to your master. He's ready to forgive you. Then give yourselves up before him. Be in Islam, submit yourself, be ready to obey. Before punishment comes to you, then you won't be helped. Now Allah mentions punishment. Allah said in the Quran, O who you believe, all of you must repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They may assume that they can delay the tawbah until they reach certain age, until they get married, until they perform their hajj, and the thoughts that they can do whatever they want to do because Allah will wait for them and Malak al Maut will wait for them. But they don't realize that Malak al Maut does not discriminate. Malak al Maut does not know whether you're young or old. It does not care whether you're rich or poor, whether you're male or female, whether you're healthy or ill. Malak al Maut has a list of names and based on that list, Malak al Maut will take the souls of the people. Indeed, we belong to Allah, and into Allah we all shall return. All of us, we commit sins in a different levels. Some of us, we are so much into sins, and others, we are away from. Some of us, we rush back to Tawbah. Others, they are persistent and insisting in continue committing the sins. All of the sons of Adam, all of us, we commit sins. And the best of the sinners are those who quickly repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But subhanallah, when we commit sins, we don't move as though our hearts are made of stones, as though we're not afraid of Allah. And the Sahab of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Tabi'in used to say, the person who is hypocrite, when he commits a sin, he feels like a fly just flew by his face and he waves it like this. And the mu'min, when he commits a ma'asiyah, he feels like he is under a mountain about to crush him. Now, look at yourself. When you disobey Allah, do you lose sleep? Do you worry? Are you concerned? Do you lose your appetite? Or you just move on? If you move on, then something is wrong with your Iman. Something is wrong with your faith. Something is wrong with the level of taqwa that you have. 
But there's a day coming, and when that day comes, there will be no community. We will all be individuals, we will all be saying nafsi, nafsi, myself, myself. There will be a kind of person who says, Oh my God! Oh, what regret I have! What have I done? That I kept falling short of what I was expected to do in Allah's presence, in Allah's company. You used to listen to Qur'an being recited, you had family members that tried to give you advice, and all of them were giving you closeness to Allah. You kept pushing them off. Man, let me do what I'm doing, okay? Stop telling me what to do. Stop giving me, I don't need your advice. I'm good enough, I'm good. This guy says, what have I done? How come I fell short? I could have done it. And then he gives the reason. I used to be from the people that kid around. I thought all of it was a joke. Forgiveness for what? Oh yeah, judgment day, yeah, sure. And the guy standing on judgment day, screaming out, Ya Allah, how could I have taken this not seriously? Why was this a joke to me? The second category of person says, Oh, if only Allah guided me. Allah decided it's, that I should be a party animal. Allah decided I shouldn't pray. Allah decided I should be lazy. Allah decided I should have an anger problem. It's not my fault, it's Allah's fault. That's what he's saying on judgment day too. He was a liar in this world and a liar in the next. Really, you hypocrite? This is how you're gonna be? This is the excuse you're gonna hide behind? And he's still saying it on judgment day. I would have been a muttaqi. If Allah guided me, Allah decided not to guide me. This is all predestination. When he sees the punishment, he says, okay, 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 okay. Fine, it is my fault. I admit, when he sees the punishment. If you just give me a second chance, I would be from not just Muslim, not just Mu'min, I would be from the Muhsineen. You worship Allah as though you can see Him. Now that He sees punishment, He goes, I'll worship Allah as though I see the punishment. I'm ready. Ya Allah, just send me back. I'm gonna be so good. These are the excuses they make. Because they had false understandings of what it means to be forgiven. And what is Allah's response to all of them? No, no, no. On the contrary. The first guy that says, Oh my God, I fell short. I'm so sorry. Yeah, your sorry is not good enough. The second guy that says, Oh, if Allah only guided me, I would have been okay. Allah says, Yeah, that's not gonna fly here. Ya yeah, Allah, if you just give me a second chance, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be good this time. I got you. I'm gonna take care of business this time. I'm gonna take it very seriously. It's not gonna be a joking matter to me now. Allah says, No. At that time is over. I gave you a message that I will forgive everything and you didn't care. You kicked it to the curb. You spit at that invitation. You thought it was a joke. That's your fault. That's your fault. Allah says, my ayat came to you. I sent my Quran from the seventh heaven. I sent it with a legion of angels to the final messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who bled so you can recite Quran one day. And you thought all of them were a lie? You ignored them? And you were filled with arrogance? You were arrogant to my message and my book? You did ignore that message that came to you from all that distance? This is who you were? No, you were a disbeliever all along. You could turn to Allah and cry that day all you want. This is the understanding of forgiveness. The ayat of Allah have come to all of us. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till tonight. I want to narrate a story. This young man was known as the thief. He was well built, strong, he feared no one. And this is Al Fudail bin Iyad. The man that he used to make the Khulafa weep until they pass out. Al Fudail bin Iyad, Rahimahullah, was a thief. And one night, he decided to go and rob and steal one of the local homes. And he went when he was climbing up. He saw the owner of the house is an old man. And he knew he could overtake, overpower this old man. And Fudayl said, let me see what this old man is going to do. And this old man, subhanAllah, with his humble home, he picked the Mus'haf, the Qur'an, and he crossed his legs, and he sat down, and he flipped the page of the Qur'an with gentleness and kindness, and he recited out loud as though Allah is saying to this old man, recite so the thief can hear your recitation. He recited this ayah, isn't it time for those who believe in Allah and His Messenger, isn't it time for them to return to Allah? 
for the hearts to tremble when they hear the recitation of the book of Allah. And subhanallah, and he sat down and he said, I repent to Allah and I will never disobey Allah. And not only that he repents, not only that, that he shed tears, but rather he decided to be on the sirat al-mustaqeem, on the right path. There was a brother who came overseas and the natural climate was that this was the first time he got freedom from his family. In his society, people are very religious, very practicing. He couldn't have the fun that he wanted to have. So he comes to a place like England, he's in a free mixing university. In a society where no girl looks at you, in fact there are no girls in your class, now all of a sudden they're sitting next to you. And you can actually find an excuse to talk to them and conversation becomes very easy. And now that you have a foreign accent, oh my God, you're a fitna for them. And this was the reality that he went through. And this attraction hit him right away. The initial stages were that he'd just go out for lunch, he'd just go out for meetings, and that is how life continued. He never actually committed zina. One day though, he went to a party, and he committed zina. Out of, you know, pure emotion, he committed zina. And when he was done, he just lay there, thinking I have just ruined myself. And he didn't know what to do. He didn't know where to go. He didn't have any close friends that could guide him. He knew that the only place that this guidance that he had known was back in his hometown. He booked a ticket back to Saudi Arabia where he was from. And on his way, he had a stopover in the country of Qatar. While he's in Qatar, he goes to the Musalla and he's just crying. And you'll see that this is one of the least most awkward situation that you'll have. You can think about when you're with people and there's this awkward silence and it's really weird. What do you do in that situation? What becomes even more awkward is when you see a grown man crying like a baby. He's crying like a baby. What do you do in that situation? One of the students of Shaykh Ibn Baz rahimahullah, he saw this man and he goes up to this man and says, Oh man, why are you crying? What's wrong? And he explains to him the situation that I committed sin and I've destroyed myself. And the only way I can get rid of this pain is if I go back and have the hudud implemented on me. This is the only way I will be purified. The student calms the man down and he says, look, don't do anything rash. Let's go back to Riyadh together and we'll deal with the situation. They head back to Riyadh and the man is still crying throughout the whole journey. He feels really bad for what he has done. The student says, look, we've arrived in Riyadh, go spend the night at home, I will call you in the morning. Just make sure you don't do anything. Don't do anything, just wait till I call you. The next morning, the student calls Sheikh bin Baz, and he asks Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, ya Sheikh, you know, this is what happened, I met this man, he committed zina, and he feels that the only way he can be purified is if he has the hudud implemented on him. Sheikh bin Baz says, tell this man not to turn himself in, but rather, the sin has been hidden from the people, continue to hide it. Rather, seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turn yourself to the Qur'an. Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be your guide. So this is what the shaykh says to the student. The student calls this man up. Let's give him a name now. His name was Ahmed. He tells Ahmed, look, the shaykh says, don't turn yourself in. Death is the easy way out. This pain and suffering will not be taken away from that act. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want this from you. But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to rectify your ways, turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is when that pain and suffering will be taken away. That is what Ahmad decides to do. A couple of days go by, he starts reading the Quran, he starts praying in the masjid, and he says that I've never missed a single salah in the masjid since that event took place. This continues for about two weeks. Now this student, he disappeared from the life of Ahmed. There was no contact between him. And then one day, he notices that he has a missed call from Ahmed. He says, later on, I'll give him a call. Another couple of days go by, and Ahmed's house is calling now. His home number is showing up on the Sheikh's phone. The student calls the house back, and he says, Assalamu alaikum, how are you guys doing? What's going on? And they say, we need to speak to you, Ahmed needs your help. And he says, definitely, I'll come over and see you tonight after Isha. He prays Isha, heads over to the house. 
and he sees that something just isn't right. That you can walk into a place, no one will say anything, but you can see it from their faces, you can see it from their sights, that something just isn't right. He goes to the father and he says, Salaamu Alaikum, he says, Wa Alaikum as -salam. He says, I don't even know what to say to you, but I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because I know if it hadn't been for you, this wouldn't have happened. And the student's thinking, what did I do? So he says, you know, well, what happened? What are you talking about? And he says, let me show you. He says, Ahmed went and prayed Salat al-Isha tonight. And he came back and he came to pray his sunnahs. And he was in his room for a really, really long time. And we went to seek him out. We didn't know what had happened to him. But I want to show you. He took the student to Ahmed's room. And there Ahmed was in sajda. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his life away at that time. And that is how he passed away. This is the story of an individual, not who was righteous, but this man committed zina, one of the biggest sins in Islam. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his life away. And inshallah, when he's resurrected, that's the deed he's going to be resurrected on, making such that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not about how you live your life in this world, but it's all about how you will be raised in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whatever you die upon is what you shall be raised upon. So let your last deed be your best one. If you're really looking for sincere repentance, you must do the following the Idnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One, change your environment, change your situation. If you want Allah to accept your repentance, you must change the way you live. You can't be in a pool of filth, impurity, but at the same time say, oh, I am going to be pure because your friends, your environment will definitely affect you. Do not say, I repented, therefore I'm okay. Let me move on. Yesterday was yesterday. Let me enjoy today. No. You should always worry about your sins until you get to Jannah. Do deeds as much as you can to offset your sins. Don't say, I made Toba and relax. You should do more and more and more every single day. Remember that every limb of yours will work against you on the day of Yom al -Qiyam. Remembering death. That death is closer to you than you expect. So remember, brothers and sisters, remember the day that you're going to be placed in that little tiny, tight place. When you have, subhanAllah, no one to be with you, no spouse, no children, no family member, no status, no comfortable bed, not beautiful rooms, none of that. But when we die, we're nothing. Remember that day that wallahi, no one will come. Yes, maybe first day, first week, first month, maybe first year. After that, your children will be busy with their own lives. Your spouse, your husband or wife will be married. You know, your wealth would be given into portions. So remember, and when you have that right in front of you, then the Toba will come sincere from your heart. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not disappoint your repentance if you are like that. But my dear brothers and sisters, we ask Allah to change the condition of the Muslims. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put taqwa in our hearts so the Toba can come for Allah to forgive us. Jazakumullahu khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.